My name is Michael Sandel. Welcome to this first episode of The Global Philosopher. Lena in Germany. Lena, what do you say? Why does it have to be nation? Why can't it be the fact that we all have stripy t-shirts or that we like to eat cheese? But you're being nation. cynical towards point, it. No, I'm Lena, but you're being me. cynical towards it. Today we take up one of the most fraught moral and political questions of our time, the question of immigration. Few issues generate more heated debate, but we rarely discuss the big philosophical questions underlying this debate. Should national borders matter? And if so, why? To discuss this question, we've gathered a group of people from around the world, not philosophers, but thoughtful citizens from a great many places, and we're engaged together in an experiment. Participants from over 30 countries are beamed up on these screens and will join in our discussion. In addition to the people visible here in the studio, hundreds more are watching online and we'll send comments by text as the discussion proceeds. The first question I would like to put to our global group of discussants is about the distinction, if any, between how countries should treat refugees and how countries should treat immigrants. Now, refugees traditionally are defined as people who are fleeing war or persecution, uh, whereas immigrants may be seeking admission to a country for any number of reasons, perhaps for greater economic opportunity. Let's begin with the following poll question about refugees. Does a country have a right to deny entry to a refugee who arrives at its border fleeing war or persecution. Eighty-six percent say no, a country does not have the right to refuse admission to a refugee. Now, I'd like to put another question to you. Does a country have a right to deny entry to an immigrant who arrives at its border fleeing dire poverty or economic hardship? Yes or no? 42% say no. Tara, in the U.S. I think the difference for myself um, is that in any country we have people living in par poverty. And you cannot control for that all the time. You can't save everyone. But when someone's coming in need of actual um, safety, and it's a matter of life or death, then I think that that's a little different for myself. Thank you for that. In Greece, Angeliki, what do you think about this? Hello, Professor. Uh, it's a great honor to, to be here with you, with everybody. I think that uh, opportunities that are everywhere, no matter where somebody is, I think it's up to the individual to find them. Uh, going to a richer country doesn't always guarantee success. Uh, I mean, we have all witnessed, you know, I uh, immigrants ending up living in worse conditions than, you know, the, than the ones they previously lived in. Uh, and besides, I think that an immigrant has the money to flee his country, his or her country, actually. So I think that it's up to the individual to decide whether or not this is a... Uh, um, a, a risk worth taking okay, so if I, if I hear you right, Angelique, you say the difference is it's a humanitarian emergency in the case of the refugee, mm -hmm. but in the case of the economic migrant, that person might be able to realize to find greater economic opportunity in a great many countries, so there's not the same kind of emergency. In Brazil, Leo, what do you say? I was an illegal immigrant myself. Uh, let me review that. Um, uh, and I spent 
three months in a detention center before I was deported back to Brazil from the UK for being there illegally. And despite all that happened to me about this immigration matter, I still believe that some countries, some European countries, have the right to take unilateral actions. I was a kind of economic migrant which moves abroad looking for a better life. Uh, the real big deal migrants we're talking about are the refugees which are fleeing from political persecution and religious intolerance and things like that. These migrants are the ones which we know among them. There will be some dangerous people. And oh, okay, well, let, let, this, is, this is very powerful testimony, Leo, because if I hear you right, what you're saying is that you yourself were an economic migrant to Britain and yes that you were forced to leave, you were deported, is that right? That's right, but I don't blame the UK border agents, they, they were doing, just doing their jobs. Okay, now, this is a pretty powerful story. In Germany, Lena, uh, what do you think of Leo's story? Oh, first of all, obviously, I think it's great that you've got a personal opinion to share on this rather than me talking theoretically, but I don't think it's a question of countries. I don't think it's a question of resources, as Tara, you called it earlier, that aren't enough for all of us, because I think in the world we've got space for all of us and we've got enough resources for all of us. And I think we're making it too easy for ourselves if we say this country is full or this country doesn't have any more to give. Plus, I think Germany, for example, has an awful lot more to give. So I think we just have to stop thinking about countries, stop thinking about races, stop thinking about religions and all these issues and just say there's one world, there's people living in it, and I think there's enough for all of us here. It's a very generous sentiment you've expressed, <laughs> Lena. But are you suggesting that national borders, ideally, from a moral point of view, should not be enforced, in fact, should be overcome? In Absolutely. Okay, so Lena has a very strong view that there is no moral significance to national borders, that ideally we should regard one another as human beings, not as members of this or that country. And therefore, you would favor completely open borders, would you, Lena? Yeah. All right, who disagrees with Lena <laughs> and would like to reply? I would uh, like to in, okay, in India, Sudhindra, you disagree with Lena. Tell us why. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to just preface my answer with something that we have always been told as children. Uh, we've always been told that the world is a global village uh, and that the Earth is our planet uh, and that uh, we have the independence to stay wherever we can. But the truth of the matter is that the reason why some countries become popular destinations for living is because they do some things right. Today, if people choose to live in countries like Switzerland, like Germany, like US and UK, it's because they do some things much better than other countries. In the UK, Simon, what do you think? I think we're at a really serious and sacred moment in our human story. And we either see ourselves as brother or other. And I couldn't agree more with what Lena's been saying. But we're all natives of this earth. And I think that um, the globalization, the economy knows no borders. Climate change knows no borders as well. So the moral argument, the logical argument just falls down. And it shows for me how obsolete the nation-centric entitlement comes in. We're in such a privileged position to be able to say yes to you, no to you. Who do we think we are? It's time that we either listen to the likes of Donald Trump or we look into the children's eyes in Calais, in Dunkirk, and we say that we are one global family together and let's open up our hearts, open up our homes, open up our borders. So Simon and Lena favor a universalistic ethic that regards humanity, not members of nations, as the relevant moral considerations. And Lena and Simon are arguing that we should, I, we should overcome the, the use and the emphasis and the enforcement of national borders. I'd like now to hear from people who disagree with that idea. In Israel, Basel. Thank you. The very existence of a state was based on the uh, presumption 
that if there is no controlling state, if there's no controlling authority, then everybody would kill everybody because that's just the laws of nature. And otherwise, when we think about it morally, uh, I personally cannot live uh, comfortably with somebody who doesn't speak my own language, who doesn't have my own culture, we do not share the humor, we do not share the same cultural background. So uh, nullifying national borders would really mix everybody with everybody and there would be no uh, culture, there would be no national heritage for any country, for any person to just say that this is who I am. There would No person would be able to morally define themselves and so, that is very, very dangerous. All right. Yeah. Um, in Brazil, Chao, what would you say? Actually, I agree with Basil because I think the world already has a lot of difference. Uh, so I think the borders is some way to organize that, to, to allow us to, to live with the people who are most like us. To live with the people who are most like us is what national borders enable us to do, Chao says in Brazil. And that's a good thing. No. No? no. Who says no? no. Who I says no? In, in uh, Italy, in Italy, Giuseppe says no. Yeah. I, I say, uh, what I can say, for example, in Italy, if you take Italy, uh, people living in north of Italy are cultur culturally more close to German people than to people living in the south of Italy. A, a very famous statement from a politician in Italy, when Italy has been built, they say, he say, now we have done Italy, we have to do Italians, meaning that uh, we came from very, very difficult cultures. So all the reasons I've seen to defend borders are only uh, cultural, economical, logistical reason, but I don't see really a moral reason. Borders come from war. Or if you take the plan, the map of Africa, you see straight line put by someone say, okay, this is uh, one state, this is another one. Okay, so, really so Giuseppe's, Giuseppe's reply is, national borders are, are the result of accident, contingency, of war. So how can they have any moral significance? That's Giuseppe's challenge in the U.S., in Wisconsin. Mitra. Yes, I would like to make several comments. Uh, one is historically, if you look at humanity, our history is a history of migration. I mean, humans, as long as they have been able to move, they have moved across the planet. This is one planet. I mean, uh, look at Europe. They have been working the last several decades or so trying to open borders exactly. because they understand there is no more reason for the borders. Uh, also understand people, if they are comfortable where they are, they, w they are not willing to give up their families, their own cultures, their own beliefs, to move halfway across the world so that they can survive in one way or another. I am an immigrant, and trust me, I understand that. It's not easy to move up, uproot yourself, uproot your entire family, and go somewhere else, learn a new language, learn a new uh, right. way of life halfway across your life. Corporations are also Im immigrants. If corporations can easily move across borders, I cannot see why humans cannot. Aha. Uh -huh. if, if corporations can move across borders, why not? Pers may I ask, you mentioned that you're an immigrant yourself. From what country? I immigrated to the United States from Iran. From Iran? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's go to Dave at the BBC, who's been monitoring the comments from those who are watching online. We've got hundreds of comments coming in. Alistair from South Africa is puzzled by the difference between inequality between countries and inequality within a country. He asks, if you allow free immigration, where do you draw the line? Living in a very unequal society like South Africa, would he, Alistair, have to allow someone from a nearby township to move into his house? And Haita, we don't know where she's from, Haita says that borders signify more than just geography. They indicate prepared political thought, cultural history, and national belief. There are others who have thoughts about this, but I want to call upon you in, by look, after we look at two of the reasons people have raised. 
in defense of borders. One argument in the defense of preserving and enforcing national borders is to do with standards of living, protecting jobs at home, protecting wages from erosion if immigrants come and compete for jobs, standards of living. We often hear that public services will be strained, welfare provision will be strained if immigrants come and take advantage so that of those services. So that's one argument. Economic arguments of various kinds to do a standard of living, GDP. And then we've heard a different argument, which is about culture, history, shared traditions. I would like to see what this group thinks about these two different arguments in favor of national borders, two arguments in favor of restricting immigration in some circumstances. Who thinks that national identity, preserving national identity, is a legitimate reason to restrict immigration? In Romania, Erno, tell us why. Uh, I think that uh, preserving national identity is something which has been done by our uh, predecessors for long centuries. And this is something which uh, uh, identifies us. And in Kenya, Deborah. T you have to take into consideration that certain, uh, some countries do not have any national identity to preserve. So for me, the, the issue of restricting uh, immigration based on that does not hold water. And I'm speaking from a perspective of uh, African countries which were cobbled up together without any regard for nationality. I mean, nation would rather. So in this regard, this national identity does not arise. And speaking as a Kenyan, I don't see that the fact that we have Somalis in the country, Sudanese in the country. Oh, these are the refugees I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking at. The fact that we have them have, has not affected uh, our Kenyanness or lack there. So in my opinion, this is not a, a reason for a country to restrict immigration. And, and that's in part because you view national borders as artificial to begin with? Absolutely, yeah. They are totally unnecessary. In Athens, Christine, what do you think? I think that the national identity is very, very important for countries uh, that have common nation. Because common nation is a constituted communi community of people with common traditions, common customs, uh, common ethnicity. So by allowing everybody to enter our borders, uh, yes, I do believe that uh, this will destroy the special national character characteristics. So Christine has cited national identity, shared culture, shared ethnicity as what makes countries distinctive, what holds them together. And that's a reason to defend borders and to enforce borders. Now, Simon, earlier on, Simon in the UK, you argued against the moral significance of national borders. Let's see if we can put Simon and Christine together on the screen. Speak directly to Christine and in Athens and see if you can persuade her. Well, I, I say, Christine, that in, in Britain here, we're, we're often cited by politicians about British values. But any kind of national identity, if it doesn't contain compassion for all, and openness to all. The identity, the brand, has no credibility whatsoever. The very idea of a national identity is oxymoronic. It needs to include all, otherwise it's simply not credible in the globalized world in which we live. You think there is no such thing as a national identity? I, I, I think that it's, it, uh, the only credible national identity is one that, uh, that opens its arms to, to others, that doesn't see itself as privileged or entitled in any way or, 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 or sees others as less worthy of, of being on this earth than the rest of us. I wonder if I could hear from someone here who defends the idea of restricting immigration for the sake of national identity, 
who can articulate what he or she takes to be the idealism of that position. In Greece, Angeliki. Uh, I would like to underline this, which uh, I think escapes, uh, escapes us all. Without being specific, there are certain religions which are, which are disguised uh, political movements, okay? They provide no education to their people, they oppress especially females uh, in uh, their countries, they brainwash their citizens, okay? And all these people, okay, they want to invade um, and uh, if, if you want corrupt uh, uh, civilized countries with uh, their own identity. So you do think. You so you do think that I, that preserving national identity is. Yeah, it's very important. We've had a lot of comments coming in from those who are watching online. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to Dave at the BBC. What are they saying? We had a comment from Ying in the Hague, who says that preserving national identity is the reason racists give for restricting immigration. There have been many comments about the pace of change. Beth from India says there's a huge difference between a gradual change to identity over 50 years and an enormous change which takes place in a short period with a big burst of immigration. And Alija says that we should remember that melting a national identity with new arrivals can actually enrich an identity. Thank you for that. In Israel, you did, Joe. What do you... What do you say? I think uh, Simon was presenting this this one criteria for uh, for being a legitimate, uh, you know, national identity. I think that that some people want to strive to have a sense of connection to culture, of heritage, of family. So to come and say that it's only legitimate to have a national identity which is an all inclusive and encompasses all citizens of the world, I think it's ignoring the very fundamental fact as a human being that we do connect to things that are similar to us, on an emotional level at least. This is not a purely logical argument, so you have to not disregard the emotional connection people have to things that are similar to them. You disagree with Simon and with of course, Lena I, I that we should transcend I, I, these differences? Yeah, I, wouldn't say I, complete, I, I wouldn't say I completely disagree. I would say that you cannot disregard the fact that people strive to feel connected to something. It's not only no. a universal world, that's part of it, but it's also a sense that people want to feel connected. And you can't completely disregard that. Like, why is that any different than just wanting to be part of everything? Lena, in Germany, Lena, what do you say? Um, why does it have to be nation? Why can't it be the fact that we all have stripy t-shirts or that we like to eat cheese? You know what I mean? Or we, you're we, being we but you're being nation. cynical At towards it. No, I've Lena, but you're being me. cynical towards it. It's no. not it's not stripy t shirts. A person has a culture and heritage. It's not something that is exactly. just a t shirt. You're just you're responding in a very cynical manner. Some people no, have no, no, connections. No. We have attachments oh. to things that are like us, not for I, just, you know, no, I, no I, sensible wait, 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 reason. Wait, wait. Go ahead, Lena. So first of all, I've got four grandparents from four countries. So which of these countries am I supposed to identify myself with? I don't know. That's, That's a personal what I mean question. by stripy t-shirts. For me, it's not about a country. It's about the fact that I feel strongly about, let's say, feminism. So yeah, I'm connected with feminists across the world. I feel strongly about children. So I like people who like children. It doesn't have to be people who also happen to have a German passport. Another point that I think is very important is we mustn't forget that nationalism and religion and culture and all these things have been used time and again as a reason to discriminate people to kill people germany not so long ago said you know what you group of religious people no longer part of our country you're not citizens anymore mm -hmm. as a reason to think we were then allowed to do whatever with them so i just think there's a massive risk to creating these kind of us and them ideas uh, yeah. And, and I don't care if it's stripy t-shirt or religion I, I or race or whatever. We, I just we, think we, 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 we don't... Wait, 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 wait. Go wait, ahead, Yadida, finish your thought. I, Lena, I just think that essentially we're, we don't really disagree. I think that it's a legitimate idea to want to be a citizen of the world. But it's also a legitimate idea to want to be a citizen of my city, of my hometown. And to find yes. that balance between between nationalism on a global scale and nationalism on an urban scale, for instance, 
is not a disagreement, but you have to okay. be able to accept both ideas. Yeah. All right, I want to try to. It's a very simple thing. Wait, 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 wait. There are there are a lot of people who are diving in at once. I am in the UK. You are a Syrian immigrant to the UK. Is that right? Tell us what you've learned from your experience about the debate we've been having. First of all, I would like to ask everyone say that the government should say no for the immigrants. Can you imagine your living in a city of camps? Imagine the diseases or illnesses surrounding you and your family. Can you imagine having a ch child in need of urgent medical care? This is how hundreds of the people, especially the Syrians, are being made to experience every day. I think the countries don't have the right to say not for the refugees. When we say about the humanitarian rights, the countries don't have the right to say no. At some time, the people who are saying that the refugees will be like uh, not a good people, I am disagree with this uh, with this say. Why? Because now I have been in the UK one year. Now I am studying. I am volunteer with four organization. One of them is national. Complete our study for a safe life for our children, not just for to found a simple life for us. Well, thank you for joining us. You broke up a little bit there. I know there are others with uh, things to contribute, wait, wait. but let me see if I can draw together some of the strands of the discussion that we've heard here today. And to see how it all connects to the debates that are raging in countries around the world about the question of immigration. On the surface, the debates about immigration seem to be about economics, about the effect of immigration on jobs, on wages, on welfare benefits, on standards of living. But it seems to me that the reason the immigration debate generates such heat and passion and anger and anxiety is that this debate touches on deeper, bigger questions than economics alone. Questions like, what do we owe one another as citizens? Do we owe more to our fellow citizens than we owe to humanity as such? Should I, as an American, care more about the welfare of someone, let's say in Texas, whom I've never met, than I should care about someone living in Mexico, just about the, uh, across the border, or not. And then there's the question of patriotism, which underlies much of this debate. Is patriotism a virtue, or is it a kind of prejudice? Back in the 18th century, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote powerfully in defense of patriotism in particularity. He said, it seems that the sentiment of humanity evaporates and weakens in being extended over the entire world, and that we cannot be affected by the calamities in Tartary or in Japan the way we are by those of a European people. Rousseau thought that we can't be affected by calamities half a world away. But what happens when we can witness those calamities almost from the moment they happen? What happens when we can discuss and debate the appropriate response to those calamities with people from around the world in a conversation like this? When we can do that, could it be that the line between members and strangers will begin to blur? Well, it's hard to know. This technology and the discussions it makes possible are really just at their infancy. But I think it is fair to say that this discussion offers us a glimpse of what reasoned global public discourse might be. And so to our participants from around the world, to those listening 
on radio to those watching online. I want to thank you for joining us for this, the first episode of The Global Philosopher. Thank you very much.